Good morning. It helps to be charged up and the power on. So that that works in our lives with God too, right? Be charged up. Let's pray. Lord, I just am so grateful. So grateful, God, for what you're doing. And Lord, we just get to play a, a part in it. God, we just get to be part of this, um, God, just massive uh, orchestration from the Spirit of God to be um, used of you. And God, that's what we want to be. We want to say again, here am I, send me, use me in some way. God, for all of us, use us. Holy Spirit, would you just come and show yourself again and again here today today? God, let your word come alive to each one of us because your word is active and sharper than a two-edged sword. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Will you turn your Bibles to Psalm 130? Psalm 130. So um, keep your place there. Uh, you know, I, I just feel like the Lord is saying this to me <clears throat> for us, that the Lord is going to meet you in every area of your life. I'd really sense that God's saying that. But here's the key. See, everything depends upon our believing in God. Everything Everything spiritually, everything naturally, believe, it, it depends upon our believing God. God's going to meet you. I just sense God saying that. He's going to meet you in every area of your life as you depend and believe in him. Believe God for those things. So don't, don't wait for 2021. 2020 is the year. I just hear God say that. It's a favorable year of the Lord. Just, but we have to hold on to that. Individually, but corporately. So God, let that be. Let it be that, God, we would believe you for the impossible as we've sung about, as we spoke about, as what was prophesied about. But God, let it be, God, that everything God, that you will bring every area of our life into alignment with you as we believe in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to, uh, I want to reiterate the, ver- the, the vision that Amy and I, we've, we've talked about this. It is really our hope, our desire, our prayer that for our church, for us, for the church at large, that we would know him and make him known. That's a desire. I just feel like that's God's heart for us to really know him. Um, if you haven't gotten one of these cards yet, take one, please. There's a bunch more at the information center. We handed them out last week if you didn't get one. Um, you know, we were giving them to families, um, but if you want your own, take that as well. Uh, we just, we want that to be, you know, a focal point where we're putting it up on our mirrors or refrigerators or some place where it's our focus. We want to get to know him. That's God's heart's desire. You see, when God said, um, or when, the, when, when some of his people, well, some of people thought that they were his people, came to him and said, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? What did Jesus respond with? He said, depart from me. I never knew you. It's about knowing. We've got to know our God. Not just play some drama out on a small basis here and there, once a week, twice a week maybe, but to to live it and to know our God for who he is and to make him known. That's what I just hear the Lord say. Hosea 6.3, we're memorizing this verse, but just to repeat it. So, Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him. He will respond to us as surely as the arrival of the dawn or the coming of the rains in the early spring. Have you ever known the sun not to rise 
over here in the east. This is east, right? Have you ever known the sun not to rise? I have never known that. I don't think I ever will, unless Jesus comes back, right? But we can solidly trust that the sun's going to come up. We can solidly trust that God, as this scripture says, that we, he will respond to us as we know him, right? Isn't that what that says? I love that. I want to share this scripture, 1 John 4, 16. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. See, we have to come to believe it, but we also have to come to know it. It's both. We don't just believe it and then we're done. We got to know it. We got to live it. We got to walk closely with our God to know his love because God is love. See, when I was in mathematics and I, I was an engineer for, for several years, but, but was trained as, as a mathematician as well, is, is the same as equals. So God is love. God equals love. That's literally what he is. He's love itself. Manifest before us when Jesus came, but he manifests his self as love in our lives on a daily basis. Amen? So what a promise that is. There's another scripture that's not up there. It's John 6, 69. This is the disciples. As they spoke about Jesus, um, as they were seeing him do the things that he said he was going to do, he, they literally said to him, um, now I have to memorize or remember my memory verse. John 6, 69, he says, we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. They believed it, but then they know it. You know, there's a difference between belief and knowing. You see? So you, we got to know who our God is, that he is the Holy One of Israel. So I'm going to give you, I kind of have a short amount of time today, but I want to give to you today um, two things, just a quick scattering of some different topics that are just upon my heart, that God's laid on my heart, and then we're going to look at Psalm 130 together. So I had to turn to there already. Um, But this is what God is telling me. He's, first of all, he's just, this is just a scattering here, okay? Keep short accounts in your relationships, in your relationship with God, in your relationship with your spouse, in relationship with your kids or in relationship with your parents. Friends, keep short accounts. If there, in other words, if there's some problem, deal with it. Don't let it just, don't bury it. Don't silence it. Deal with it. Come before God. Talk to God about it. And don't make it a long account. In other words, don't wait a long time to deal with it and just assume that it's going to be fine. Take care of it. That's what just God keeps telling me. So family devotional time. I just hear the Lord keep saying this to me too. You know, our kids are almost grown. Um, our two are grown, um, but our other two are in high school and we're looking at about three more years, you know, and they're going to both be out of the home. And so that's crazy to me. And I just believe so wholeheartedly that we, as we're home, we're with our kids, we're with, you know, if it's just you and your spouse or, or who you're living with, family devotion times are really important. This, you know, every, Amy and I made a commitment that when we had kids, but right beforehand, we're like, we want to have the word of God be a focus in our household. And so honestly, that has not been easy. And we've tried to have devotional times. We're like, oh yeah, this is gonna be awesome. It's gonna be like 30 minutes long. And we're like, two minutes later, we're like, oh, what's going We're not gonna survive. Or they're not gonna survive. Something's not gonna happen. Um, anyway, so those, those minutes sometimes are really difficult, but we persisted. And we may have only read just a small little, I don't know, three, four, five verses or something like that. But you know what? If you speak God's word in your home, faith comes by hearing the word, right? We got to speak of God's word. That's how faith grows. So do that in your homes. Each morning, we just, again, before school, we would do that. Um, And I am so grateful because it made the centerpiece of our day, the beginning of our day, about God and his word. And pray together. Pray together with your family. 
every day in some way, just something small. Pray for them before your kids go to bed. Pray with them. Pray with your spouse. Things are always coming up for Amy and I that we're just, we pray together a lot of different times. And, and at least once or twice a day, it seems like, with our kids or just together. Um, those that pray together stay together. So we need to put God first. Integrity. I just feel like God is saying this. Integrity. If you say something, do it. If you say something, do it. You know what? God says it. We can trust him, right? We need to be able to be trustworthy with what we say ourselves. Tithes and offerings. You know, this, this is an, um, always a fun topic, right? Um, you know, because money hits us where our heart is. It does. And, uh, you know, we're giving away the, um, the, giving, the giving receipts we're giving to you this, this week to start with. And, you know, we are grateful for just how, how faithful you've been to God. And, uh, and, but, you know, honestly, this, this is interesting. Money's important to God because it really does, again, show our own hearts. 16 of 38 parables have something to do with money. 16 out of 38. Okay, so 16 times 2 is 32. So it's almost half, right? It's almost half, like 40, probably 42, 43% um, off the top of my head. Somebody figure that out, will you? No. Um, in any case, but listen to this. Prayer, verses about prayer. There's about 500 in the scriptures. Verses about faith. A little less than 500. But guess how many about money and possessions? Money and possessions together, over 2,000 verses. That tells you the focus that God has upon that. Not because he needs our money, but he knows that we can be so attached to it. And it can control our lives. And I, it's, it's something that we have to allow. Okay, God, what... Who has control? God has, he needs to have control, right? Of everything of our lives. And so I just encourage you for this year, um, you know, there is blessing. I have seen blessing when people tithe their money. I've seen blessing when people um, just really commit everything to God. And I've seen families and couples that God is so faithful. I see the faithfulness of God when, they're, when they are not letting money control them. I just want to just share that with you. Savings is good too. I think I've, I've heard this with John Bevere recently. I just listened to a lot of stuff from him because I really respect him. But he, he says 10% to tithe and 10% to savings. And I'm really into finances and just really wanting to not let it control me. I want to control it to do what, it, what God wants to do through it. Okay? So that's my scattering. Okay, Psalm 130. Would you look at that with me? Let me read this to you. I'm going to be reading from the New King James. Out of the depths, I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you might be feared, or you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word, I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Amen? Good word. So let me me share with you. This is something that I learned as I was studying this scripture. At the very beginning of this chapter, it actually says a song of ascents. If you have a study Bible, it probably says that. A song of ascents. What does that mean? So there are actually 15 psalms that are a song of ascents. An ascent as in you're ascending a hill, you're going up, so to speak. 
And so that's what the intent, that's what those, these are all these Psalms, the Psalms, these 15 from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134 are called the Song of Ascents. And there's an ascension going on in each one of these about lifting God up. And you can see within this very chapter itself, it starts out really low, doesn't it? Out of the depths I've cried out to you. Haven't we been there? right? Out of the depths we cry out to God. But in the end, it talks about how him, how he is giving his abundant redemption. So it really ascends from this low place to this high place. And that's really the the picture of this particular psalm I, I just wanted to point out to you. So the pilgrims back in this time frame, the pilgrims, that is those from outside of Jerusalem, would literally ascend to the high place of Jerusalem from where they were. And I had, I've never been to, to Jerusalem before. I hope to one day. I think it would be amazing to be where Jesus walked and where the disciples walked and where some other, other people of this word were. I would love that. But in any way, um, there's an ascension that took place when they, when they went from their villages to Jerusalem and they would sing these psalms as songs. That's, that's the real point of these 15 different chapters. So I wanted to, and, and by the way, they were going to feasts and, and festivals on a, on a yearly basis and sometimes more than that, right? So this was a common place. And we can imagine that happened when Jesus went in to Jerusalem to be crucified. They were singing these songs. And then the triumphal entry, they were singing songs. So this is a favorite psalm of many, as I've done some research on it. It was actually John Calvin's favorite psalm. Not only that, it was uniquely used in John Wesley. Remember John Wesley? John Wesley was the one who started the Wesleyan church. Greatly used of God, both of these men. But you know what? This is very interesting. You may not have known this. But John Wesley was a pastor and a minister, but he wasn't a Christian at the time. He was unconverted. And what happened to him to actually bring him to Christ was Psalm 130. And here's how it happened is that Martin Luther was actually preaching and speaking about it and it hit him. It struck him in the heart. And I'll tell you what struck him in a second here, but it was later on that afternoon that John Wesley, that, that afternoon he went to St. Paul's Cathedral and the, and the choir was singing a chant, and it was a good chant. It was about God's word. Anyway, they were actually singing Psalm 130. But what they were singing was verse 3. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? And they kept saying it over and over again. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Who could stand? You know what? That just struck him to the heart and it caused him to see himself honestly and to see that he couldn't stand. In fact, his response to this was, I couldn't stand. He wrote this down. I couldn't stand. I would be unable to stand before God. Isn't that the case for all of us? We would fall down before our God. So we could not stand if he marked our iniquities. In other words, if he kept track of them and he held it against us, thank God he doesn't do that, right? Praise God that he doesn't do that because of the blood of Jesus Christ, amen? But the Lord used this in Wesley's life and he became a Christian and then God used him greatly later on. You know, again, this is, this is a true psalm of ascent. And I want, you, I want to just point out um, four different pieces of this psalm, okay? The first piece is verse one and two. And it's really the psalmist crying out, crying out to God. The second part is verses three and four. And that's the psalmist really breaking before God, which is that verse that I just read. The third part is verses five and six where the psalmist is really waiting upon God, as we read. And the last, the fourth, is seven and eight, where the psalmist is really then preaching the good news about God. 
That's kind of how this is broken down. And I think it's a real normal um, progression in our lives. When we're in a difficult spot and we have all been there and there's probably more to come, right? I hate to be a bearer of bad news. But they, bad times will come. Difficult times, difficult times will come because in this world, we have tribulation, right? But God says, be of good cheer for I've overcome the world. So as you look at this, where we're, it's this beginning point of just being broken or crying out to God because we realize that we are powerless. Then we look to our God in the sense of, of we're broken before him because we can't stand before him. And then we move into waiting upon him because we know that waiting upon him is the only thing that's going to renew our strength, right? And then we move into speaking about how God met us. He built us. He strengthened us in the weight. And in the weight, we, we were able to speak or be in, in, empowered to speak. And so that's how I see this particular psalm. You know, I want to I point out a couple of things here. Um, iniquities. The iniquities actually is derived from the word avon. I hope I said that right. Um, A-V-O-N. Looks like Avon, which we have a city, Avon, near um, Vale in our state. But it's Avon. And Avon literally means... It's, it's derived um, from a word um, that literally means evil bent. An evil bent. You know what? Wouldn't you agree that there is an evil bent within humanity? There's an evil bent within each one of us. We're just bent towards that. We're naturally bent towards that. And we're drawn to that in the flesh. And so I just, I find that so interesting and truthful and honest about ourselves. And with that iniquity, we can't stand. But I want to talk, I want to go backwards just a, a second here. Um, out of the depths, beginning in the first verse. Out of the depths, I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. I want to remind you of, of another story. It's about the blind man on the, on the road. This is in Luke chapter 18. I'm not going to turn there. But it starts with verse 35, I think it is. Um, yeah, verse 35 through 43. But the blind man, he heard some commotion going on. I'm going to give like the child version like uh, um, Josiah gave earlier. There was, there was a lot of commotion going on and he was wondering what's happening. And someone said that Jesus is coming by. And what he immediately did was just started crying out, son of David, have mercy upon me. Son of David, have mercy upon me. And he got louder and people were like, be quiet, be quiet. You're, you're embarrassing me. You know, it doesn't say that in the scripture, but I, I can assume that people were thinking that. Be quiet. We want to see Jesus and you're just messing it all up, right? And he keeps getting louder. He's like, I don't care. Lord, have mercy upon me. Son of David, have mercy upon me. And what happens in this scripture, it literally says, Jesus stood still. Is that awesome? I just love that. That's the very first thing that Jesus did. When he heard this cry, he stood still. We can stop God if we cry out to him. And I'm not saying that we're stopping him from doing what he wants to do. He's waiting for the cry to stop. He doesn't want to walk past us. He wants to walk with us, to us. Amen? And so not only did he stood, stand still, but what does it say next? In the next part of this verse, it literally says, and he commanded him, that should be a small h, he commanded him to be brought to him, to Jesus. Okay? That's amazing. Don't you want Jesus to command you to come to him because you've cried out? I love that. And so then it goes on, on 1841, it says, what do you want me to do for you? Just as Jesus saying, don't you want God to say that to you? What do you want me to do for you? I'll do it. Because if he's asking it, he's not going to just say, oh, sorry, I was just kidding you, right? <laughs> he's going to do it. He's going to do it if he's asking you. So you cry out first, 
right? You realize you're broken. This fits the Psalm 130, right? And you realize you're broken. And then you, you come upon him and you wait upon him to speak to you. That's what we're doing in this fast. We're waiting upon him to speak to us. Then he speaks and he says, what do you want me to do for you? I want to ask you, will you do that right now for, for 2020? Just ask the Lord. Everybody, just, would you just bow your heads right now, just before God? God, what do you want me? What do you want from, or, I, 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 let, me, let me turn this, reverse it. It's, I think it's Jesus saying, what do you want me to do for you as you're crying out to God? Tell the Lord what you want him to do right now. Tell him the Lord. Just take just 10 seconds. God. Thank you, God. God, you're asking the question, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, we, we hear you. God, we want you to change our lives. God, to reflect you more. God, we want you to work in us. Work in us. God, your kingdom, your purpose, God, you're everything, everything to us. So I want to finish with this. But worship team, coming up, if you would. Um, the waiting. The waiting is important. And I want to encourage you to wait. This is our t- we're in time of fasting right now in prayer. But you know, the waiting for the watchman, as it says, it repeats. It's a poetic thing, but it, ref- it reflects the, the focus of what God wants us to have here. It's more than watchmen wait for the morning. Yes, more than watch. More than those who watch for the morning. See, the watchmen, you know what? They, they were waiting for the morning because that was the time that they got off duty, right? Don't we all sometimes just wait to get off duty, from work or whatever. We are waiting for that. We are focused upon that. God wants us to wait like that with urgency, waiting upon him, just waiting. But the preaching part, I'll finish with this. Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. This is our declaration as God has met us. Hope in the Lord, oh, Israel. Oh, people of God, hope in the Lord. That's my, my cry to you. Hope in the Lord this year, 2020. Hope in the Lord. Because as it says, for the, with the Lord there is mercy. Cry out to God for mercy like the blind man. There is mercy with the Lord. As it says right there, and if he says it, it's true. And with him is abundant redemption. Abundant redemption. Not just a little bit of redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his bent wickedness right he will he'll redeem us from that bent and change it with inside of us would you stand with us it's good news God there's good news in you and we worship you let's worship the Lord just wait upon him Yeah.